Hello. Good morning, everyone. Uh, so before I dive into my talk about context, a little context on me. Uh, my name is Jason Wentworth. I'm a software architect at Course Hero. A little background on how we've been using Cor or Go at Course Hero. We have mostly been using it for just over a year now. Uh, we are using it to build our backend microservices. So we're in the process of pulling out from our monolithic application into microservices. And about a year ago, we transitioned to building those backend microservices in Go. Those are mostly all REST-based HTTP services. Uh, we are transitioning to gRPC for those right now. We also have things that process from queues and CLI processes, things of that nature. So mostly backend processes, but usually HTTP requests interacting with the database, things of that nature. So if you're not aware what a context is, uh, the Go context package defines the context type as something which carries deadlines, cancellation signals, and other request scope processes across API boundaries. So I'm not going to talk a whole lot about deadlines or cancellation, but it's a way to propagate different cancellation signals, timeouts, things of that nature. Uh, and then there is this whole other half of it with request scoped values. Um, and one of the reasons that we need this context to propagate is go uh, if you want to communicate with different Go routines or different processes, doesn't have something like thread local storage or anything along those lines, so your memory needs to get propagated through your call stack, and context is a way to solve that. So what does getting a context value look like? It's fairly straightforward. So if we have a context, we can ask it for a value, give it any key, and get some value out. Uh, as we can see from the signature, the key can be any interface, and the value returned is any interface. There's a lot of hidden complexity behind this, though, because if the context doesn't have a value for that key, you'll get nil back. And typically, if you're interacting with something through a value, uh, you probably need to do something on top of it just being an interface. Usually, interacting with an interface by itself probably isn't going to be useful. So what should you use context values for? Uh, again, the documentation gives some guidance here for request scoped data that transits processes and APIs. I'm going to talk about a couple examples that we've used and a couple uh, anti-patterns that we've seen as well. But the places that we are using context today is our HTTP request information. So again, most of our processes are HTTP requests. When something comes in, we have a collection of standardized data that we want to make available and propagate through all of the process that we're running and into any other microservices that we call from our base one. Um, that dovetails into distributed tracing as well. We use libraries for distributed tracing. Most of these interact with context. We'll put transactions and things like that into context in order to um, actually trace and go through your application. And then maybe slightly more controversially, we do use context to enable some of our logging. Uh, and I'll go into that a little bit more in depth because if in general, that's a slightly more controversial decision than some of the HTTP request information. One general rule of thumb is to not use context to obscure your API. So if we imagine that we have a dog walking service and we have a function to walk our dog, if we had both of these functions that were doing the exact same thing, uh, but the second one is relying on a dog walker being in a context, I've obscured what this API is. I've made it harder to rationalize around what it's doing, identify where data is coming from, uh, and debug issues. If I come across this API, I may not realize I need to give it a dog walker. I might not understand what actually goes along with that. So one general rule of thumb we've identified to help correct this is all of your functionality should work with a context.background pretty much the same as any other context. Uh, a context that background is a context that's provided that essentially has no functionality. It has no values, it has no cancellation or deadlines. So it's basically a blank context on which most other contexts are usually based. Uh, and typically it's an anti pattern that we've identified where if your context or if your function, in order to express its functionality, needs a specific context, um, you're probably obscuring that API. You're making it more difficult to understand how your application is running and how it's being built. You also lose all of the advantages you gain with the compiler and compile time checking on what's actually passed in because you're going through that context. And largely, one of the reasons for this is that there's a lot of decisions that go along with just the raw interacting with the context value. 
Um, you need to understand, well, first you need to know what the actual key you're looking up is. It's fairly straightforward, but you need to actually have that. Uh, you need to know what to do in the event that it's not present in the context. You need to know the type and you need to assert that. And every time you're going through that, you need to make sure you're doing all of those steps. So there's a lot of decision making that actually needs to happen when you are actually using the direct context value functionality. So let's talk about this through one of our examples. So as I mentioned, uh, what we call header data, uh, this is information that really in originates with a request. We typically pass it along through HTTP headers. That's why we call it our header data. It'll include things like a request ID, um, session IDs, potentially user IDs, essentially the contextual information around a request that's coming in. Um, we want to make sure that that information is propagated across all of our microservices. We call microservice A is gonna call microservice B. We wanna make sure that we have that same session ID, we have those same request IDs, so that we're storing that with our data and our information. So back to our dog walking service, if we had that, those values in our context and we wanted to make another HTTP request to another service as a result of walking our dog, uh, this might be the code that we would use to extract a header from a context. We would need to know the key, we need to do a type assertion, and we need to figure out what to do in the event that it's not there. Um, again, this is potentially a lot of cognitive load that you're putting on essentially the caller of your application to understand what to do in that case. Um, and the general rule of thumb, if your function shouldn't be dependent on values in context, but just supplement with the values that are there, add it to logging, add it to tracing. Um, it's a lot of decision making that needs to happen every time you're interacting with it. So the answer is generally to read and write from a context in as few places as possible. Make dedicated functions to interact with the context, and in those places you can handle default values and error cases. Um, usually we are making independent packages. Again, the, the cases that we found where it's valuable are generally these tracing, these observability situations. And there, uh, there it makes sense for it to be its own package so that we can leverage it across different microservices and other situations. And so one way you can make sure that you're using those functions is to simply not export your keys. If you have a custom type for your keys and you don't export those keys, it's impossible for anything else to overwrite your value or um, access it outside of your dedicated functions. So here's a little example of what that code would look like. It's fairly straightforward. We would define a new type for our key, actually define that key, and then the actual core of this function is very similar to what we had before, but now it's in a function dedicated for that. We can definitively make decisions about what our header data should look like uh, in the event that there's, it's not already present in a context. And then using it becomes much more simple, much more straightforward. If we have this header package, we ask for the header data from the context, and then we can propagate that long, along through our calls. Uh, one point I want to make is to make sure that you're just thinking about the general API. So this from context, new context, nomenclature, is pretty standard across things that interact with context, tracing libraries, things of that nature. Um, but uh, make an API that's reasonable for the data structures that you're returning there. Again, with the general guidance that normally your functionality should work with any given context, usually it's more of the, the top layer where we're setting sensible defaults. Uh, but there could be situations where it makes sense to return a bool whether or not it was actually found or possibly an error. So the goal is to make a coherent API that uses context around here. So again, don't simply just make a from context if you don't need it. Uh, make an API around interacting with that data. Even in the header example, um, we typically are attaching our headers much closer to the HTTP call. So we have things that are taking in context to make those calls that are attaching it, as opposed to everything that's making an HTTP call, extracting the headers and attaching it themselves. So make a coherent API and only really provide the direct data access if something actually needs it. So now let's talk about how, we, how this applies to logging and how we use context to use our logging. So we've made a package to make contextual aware logging. Um, it stores logging data in a context. 
and then there are logging functions that accept a context, and any time those are called, it will append any of that logging data that is present in the context. Uh, we use Logris to use our logging, so this is all really just a thin wrapper on top of Logris. So if you're familiar with that, it sort of has this concept of adding data uh, to a logger. Um, but let's talk about why I think logging is a use case for this. At the end of the day, I would say that logging cares about context. It is contextual. Um, and we're usually using it as a debugging tool. So back to our dog walking service. We may have our dog walking functionality that can go through one of our licensed dog walkers, or the dog owner can tell us, I walked my own dog. The underlying code that we call may be the same. We may have logging in that code. Uh, it may not care whether or not it's being called from the dog walker context or the dog owner context, other than I want to make sure to attach that information to my logs. So it's important when I'm debugging that, when I'm looking at that information, if I'm running analytics on it, that I can identify uh, where those situations are coming from, simply even if it's coming from two different endpoints that are calling that same functionality. As an example, here's a few potential log lines that could be emitted. In the top case, I might know Sparky was walked. Um, that's interesting, but not as useful as the bottom two cases where I may know not only was Sparky walked, but a specific walker ID, a request ID, I could trace that through all of our system and identify all of the logs that relate to any of this contextual information. So looking at a couple ways we could solve uh, this problem, if we had this general chain of calls, HTTP submit request, uh, dog walker walk, and then functionality for the dog actually going for a walk, we could just initiate a new logger and pass it down the call stack. This would work. This was how we started uh, doing this with Logris. Logris supports this kind of functionality. Um, but again, logging seemed contextual to us. We kind of ran into this problem with the headers as well, where it seemed like we didn't necessarily care about the logger for any of the core functionality of any of these functions. We were just appending it because we really wanted the logging to have that contextual information. So instead, we decided to put that logging data into the context in order to facilitate that. Um, this was also very ubiquitous. We needed to pass this logger through all of our functionality. Uh, we may have to log at any point in time. So we were already adding context to everything because we're using it for cancellation and we're using it for distributed tracing. So we already have that contextual propagation that way. Uh, and so we decided to leverage it for logging as well. Now there's a lot of opinions on using context out there. Uh, probably my my favorite quote on this topic specifically is Dave Cheney has a blog post on using context values and mentions, in my opinion, passing loggers inside context on context would be the worst solution to the problem of decoupling loggers from implementation. So obviously I take a pause when the solution that, that I've implemented, I find a blog post that says not only is that a bad idea, but it's definitively the worst idea. Uh, so let's come back to this in a second. Uh, so let's look at what our API actually looks like. Again, if you're familiar with Logris, it's basically Logris with context appended at the front. So we have the ability to create a new context with logging fields. You pass in a parent context and then some field data, and you get a new context back out. Then we have a series, and there's more than this, but a series of logging functions that are typical logging functions. There's nothing really special about them other than they accept a context at the front and then whatever log information you want after that. So interacting with this largely feels like interacting with the standard log package or any log package. So in our dog walker walk command, we create a new context with fields. There's no logging that we want to do in this specific case, but we want to make sure any logging that happens is aware of this walker ID that we're appending here. Then inside the actual dog logic, we are actually doing a log line there. We may not care if we're coming from the dog walker or the dog owner or a separate context, uh, but by doing this, that log line will now contain the full information around what happened to get to that point of the log line, which can be very valuable when debugging and identifying what actually happened, what actually is going on. So all of our functions have default behaviors with context.background. It's a logger, so it basically does what you would expect if you call it off of context.background, logs, uh, and is very similar to interacting with any logging package. So there's not 
a very different feel to using int versus using anything else for logging. So let's revisit this quote and see the continuation of it. Uh, so we'd have gone from explicit compile time dependency to an implicit runtime dependency, one that could not be enforced by the, enforced by the compiler. So in, in this blog post, a lot of the issues he has with dealing with context are some of the issues that I talked about earlier, some of the problems with needing to um, figure out what happens when you get a nil, do actual type checking. So I think at least from this point, we don't have this problem here. Our interacting with the logger does have compile time checks. All the actual using of the context is pushed inside of that package where we can uh, make sure that it works given any given context and make sure that it's easy to use and understand how to use it. There are still a few concerns to keep in mind. Uh, I mentioned earlier our main context is HTTP requests and interacting with databases. So sub millisecond performance isn't usually something that's a major concern to us. Uh, so contexts in general are layered. If you haven't interacted with them, typically you're building a context off another one and each layer of a context does one very simple thing and then passes the functionality on to whatever it's based on. So you kind of have to be aware and um, keep in mind this layering when interacting with it. Uh, usually this means just being careful when you're creating new contexts. So I generally like to think of this context wrapping as kind of a nesting doll or an onion, something where you're constructing something on top of another layer. These are examples of just the base context package and the ways you can create them, again, all based on a parent context. So we did some general performance of our benchmarking of our log package um, for different context steps. And honestly, these get very silly very quickly, like even a context depth of 10 is pretty high, um, but certainly the 100 and 1,000 are pretty um, out there. But these times are all sub-millisecond, generally not a major concern while we're doing logging. This, this is actually a performance with actually logging to a buffer. This is basically just the performance of context.value. Um, so it's even, even smaller. So in general, this wasn't a major performance concern for us, but be aware of what your situation is how your performance uh, constraints are when interacting with context just in general due to that nesting. There's also a few simple ways to make bugs when doing kind of context wrapping. Uh, this is something I've done and seen from time to time, so just wanted to kind of highlight this in a slide or two. So in this case, if we're walking a range of dogs, iterating over them, we may want to make a new context. Here I'm using the logger as an example, but the same thing would be true with with value or with deadline. And I'm, as you can see, I'm reusing that same context variable in every point. So what I end up making is a context based on the previous context from the previous iteration of the loop, so on and so forth. So if there was a thousand items here, I'd have a thousand layer context pretty quickly. Uh, they'd all fall, fall off once we end this function, but it could potentially cause this individual function to balloon. There's several ways to solve it, but simplest one, just simply make sure you're aware of what your parent context is and think about that. So thinking about that, we could identify that we don't really want to use the previous loops iterations context. We want to make sure that we're only using that context for the duration of that loop. So in summary, um, don't use context values to hide your API. It makes it harder to understand what's going on. It makes it harder to debug, harder to look at. Um, when you are interacting with context values, put them inside a function or a package to isolate where they're being used, control where they're being used, so you can monitor and understand what's actually happening there. Context values should really describe the overall circumstances of your application the REST request it's coming in on or the backend process it's running on, it shouldn't define core functionality, shouldn't alter major portions of your functionality. Again, we mostly use it for tracing, observability, logging. I wanna know the session ID, how that interacts with everything, and just be aware of your parent context when you're wrapping, what that is, how you interact with that. Um, and that's it, so thank you. Uh, if you have any questions for me in the breaks, I'll be hanging out by the Course Hero booth or see me around here. I'm happy to talk about context or how we use Go at Course Hero or anything else. Thank you.